Yes. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Racism and the Colonial Roots of Gendered Language in Public Health and Biomedicine. My name is Danae Schmidt, and I am the Senior Manager of Engagement and Training at the USBC, and I'm so glad you've joined us for today's session. This educational activity has been verified for one CDR CPE unit and one R IBLC SERP credit. At the end of the webinar, we will share with you how to request your continuing education. This webinar has been made possible through funding from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Neither the CDC nor any of its components operate, control, are responsible for, or necessarily endorse the content of this webinar. I'm going to ask my tech folks to please turn on live transcription during this webinar. As a reminder, the transcription will be auto-generated and may contain errors. To turn it off, just go to live transcript in your Zoom doc and choose CC live transcript. During the presentation, participants will be in a listen-only mode. Despite the virtual format of this session, we do hope that it will be as interactive as possible. So please share your insights and questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A feature located in your Zoom doc. If you're having audio issues through your computer's microphone and speakers, please try dialing in for audio connection. If your challenges persist, please email office at usbreastfeeding.org and one of our staff members will do their best to troubleshoot with you. <clears throat> As a reminder, this presentation is being recorded and will be accessible to all webinar registrants within one week of the live session. The USBC is committed to holding brave learning spaces where first food field advocates can explore difficult issues with courage and curiosity. So before we dive into today's session, we wanted to make or take a moment to center our Brave Space Agreements, which were shared with you all in the reminder emails. The Brave Space Agreements are expect and presume welcome, assume positive intentions, be a learner, engage with bravery and curiosity, stay engaged, listen, 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 and process while caring for yourself, lean into discomfort, Speak your truth with respect, understanding that it's only part of the truth. Attend to impact. Grace with ourselves, grace with others. What's said here stays here. What's learned here leaves here. Expect and accept non-closure. So what is one agreement you most want to hold yourself to during today's session? I'm going to ask my webinar producer to launch the poll we have to see where our audience is leaning in today. So take a moment and let us know what is resonating with you most today. We have about 60% participation, so we'll give people another second or two. Wonderful. All right, thank you everybody. We have around 85%. Should I go ahead and end? Let's give it maybe 10 more seconds. I still, I still see folks selecting. So make that choice. And we are going to go ahead and close that poll. All right. So it looks like most of 31% um, are um, leaning into being a learner, engaging with bravery and curiosity. 
And then coming in very close, listen, 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 and process while caring for yourself, staying engaged. Awesome. Well, I hope that um, I'm, I'm glad we were all able to make a personal connection uh, to those brave space agreements today. So today's session is part of USBC's ongoing capacity building supports, which are designed to build the field's readiness, power, and efficiency in advancing policy systems and environmental changes that make breastfeeding and human milk feeding a viable option for most families. I'm so excited to introduce Dr. Anshali Palmquist as today's presenter. Dr. Palmquist is a medical anthropologist and international board certified lactation consultant, currently serving as an assistant professor at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, Department of Maternal and Child Health, Gilling School of Global Public Health, and as an affiliate of the Carolina Global Breastfeeding Institute. Her interdisciplinary work, which includes community-based participatory research, addresses the intersectionality of perinatal maternal, newborn, and young child health disparities globally and in the U.S. and bridges critical biocultural anthropology and global public health. We are honored to have Dr. Palmquist bring her knowledge and expertise as the USBC in the first food field begins its learning journey around gender inclusive language. During today's presentation, she will introduce essential concepts around gender, sex, and culture, share examples of how racism has played a role in the language we use today, and offer some practical ways first food stakeholders can use inclusive language to transform their own work in their communities. As a disclaimer, the viewpoints expressed in this presentation are those of the speaker and do not necessarily reflect the views and policies of the USBC nor our funders. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Palquist. Thank you so much for that introduction. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my slides. All right, how does that look? Good. It looks great. Okay, thank you. So I'm very honored to have the opportunity to speak with you today. And I appreciate um, the USBC for making time for this important um, conversation and creating such a, a wonderful um, environment for us to have some dialogue. Um, this is my standard IP slide. Um, I don't have any disclosures to share. And before I begin, I'd like to open with um, a land acknowledgement. I am coming to you today from North Carolina, and North Carolina is home to the Okanichi, Lumbee, Kohari, Halawa Saponi, Eastern Band Cherokee, Meharan, Tuscarora, Saponi, Wakamasuan nations, along with many other indigenous peoples. May we all commit to standing with First Peoples and their descendants through cultivating good relations and collective action. May we all stand together against the racism that continues today with words and actions, truth, integrity, and honor. I want to also share my positionality with regard to this topic and the content in this presentation. So I am a cisgender woman with Thai and Italian Irish ancestry whose body, reproductive capacity, identity, sexuality, and social roles are accepted as normal in US society. My pronouns are she, her, hers, or they, them, theirs, the latter with origins from the gender inclusive pronoun kao in the Thai language. I hold three degrees in anthropology with specializations in biocultural and medical anthropology and the anthropology of reproduction. And my work is grounded in reproductive justice, health equity, and human rights. My mother was not given the opportunity to breastfeed me. Her rights were taken away when they treated her at the a hospital in Philadelphia. They treated her engorgement with an injection to dry up her milk without her consent. Fighting against reproductive oppression among immigrant and refugee women is particularly personal for me. My mother, grandmothers, and great-grandmothers were survivors of war, trauma, gender-based violence, poverty, and US military imperialism. And I am a survivor of intergenerational trauma. I understand the effects of colonialism and Euro-American cultural imperialism 
through my education, as well as my lived experience from the stories of my family and my ancestors. My mother, who is native Thai, is my namesake. I am my daughter's namesake. We are all firstborn daughters and we are the keepers of our family's history. I've spent my life reflecting on the history of my ancestors and also more recently on what it means for me to be speaking with you today. I have reclaimed breastfeeding as a cultural tradition for our family and breastfeeding has been a pathway of healing. I also come from a cultural background that has always recognized sex and gender diversity and fluidity and these have shaped my own cultural understandings of gender identity, sexuality, and kinship. And all of this shapes um, my positionality to the presentation today. So the learning objectives for this session are first to describe settler colonial influences on the language used in public health and biomedicine, to challenge inflexible views of language in the first food field through science, respectful dialogue, and cultural humility and to name resources and practices for researching cultural perspectives on language. However, my personal goals for this presentation are to lift up the scholarship and voices from the Global South and scholars of color on racism and the coloniality of gender. And you'll see that I will use direct quotes from their writings um, to illustrate these contributions. And I feel this is very important praxis as these ideas and voices have been neglected and ignored in, most, in the most vocal recent rhetorical writings about gender inclusive language for our field. I'll share critical ideas and perspectives that I hope will help move our field forward and give us some new tools to think with and to empower allies and accomplices to engage in dialogue about person-centered inclusive language with evidence and courage. Most of us are at least somewhat familiar with the misogyny and patriarchy of Western biomedicine and how these historical biases have negatively impacted obstetrics and gynecology and lactation even today. Here's a photo of a patient being prepared for twilight birth. Eleanor Cleghorn in an essay on the long history of gender bias in medicine writes that at every stage in its long history, medicine has absorbed and enforced socially constructed gender divisions. These divisions have traditionally ascribed power and dominance to men. In modern scientific medicine, as it has evolved over the centuries as a profession, an institution, and a discipline, has flourished in these exact conditions. What I've decided to focus on today are two really fundamental questions. I'm not really going to answer the question about what language should we use and how should we integrate different kinds of terminology into our practice because there are many tools out there available for us. I actually want to start kind of much at a much basic level, more basic level, to talk about why is biological sex or the dichotomy of sexes in, in, in humans and or gender an organizing principle in Western biomedicine and public health? And then what does gendered language have to do with racism? To explore these questions, I'm going to work, walk you through um, what is called the concept of the coloniality of gender. So when we think about colonialism, we have to recognize that in the mid-1400s, mid by the time that Columbus and other Western European explorers embarked on their um, discovery journey, their societies were firmly stratified by sex and gender already. And their medical system at the time also reinforced these divisions. These are patriarchal societies and Christian societies for the most part. And Western European medical theory and practices at this time were deeply rooted in Greek medical theory, humoral theory, and rudimentary understandings of anatomy and physiology. So one example of how sex differences became entrenched in Greek medical theory was the idea that the uterus was the defining organ that separated humans. And the uterus, for people that had a uterus, was the, the reason for the explanation for all different kinds of ailments. There was the idea of the traveling uterus. Um, and in Greek, hysterica is the name of the uterus. And for any ailment that happened to occur in the body of someone who had a uterus, the uterus was responsible. So if there was a breast ailment, it was thought that the uterus had traveled up to the breast tissue and created um, some kind of, uh, of pathology. So the wandering uterus 
um, was that, that explanation. And then also this idea of hysteria was deeply tied to having a uterus. And so the word hysterectomy comes from the extraction of the uterus to solve problems, including um, mental health issues. And to give some context for how, um, how uh, strong and sort of uh, um, just the power of these ideas, um, the idea of hysteria and the diagnosis of hysteria wasn't removed from the DSM inventory until 1980. So there's a lot of traction and a lot of power in sort of these concepts. <clears throat> so in a 2019 TED Talk, Mark Charles explains the significance of the doctrine of discovery. And a section of it is excerpted here in the slide. And so he explains that with this doctrine of discovery, the church in Europe was saying to nations throughout Europe that wherever you go, whatever land you find, not ruled by white Christian Europeans, are yours for the taking. And this is literally the doctrine that let European nations go into Africa, colonize the continent, and enslave the people, that they didn't believe them to be human. It is at this time period in the mid 1400s where these ideas about sex differences, the organization, the stratification of societies based on a prototype of Western European societies was already really formally entrenched and being exported through colonialism. But importantly here, with this doctrine of discovery and with these assumptions that non-European societies were somehow less than humid, formed the foundation of racist ideas and justified the colonization of indigenous peoples. Charles notes that white owning, white land owning men gave themselves the authority to decide who is human and not human. There are many scholars who have looked at the afterlives and sort of after effects of colonialis colonialism around the world. So Franz Fanon and Paulo Frida began to write about the intergenerational and cumulative effects of Western European colonization on people and societies. Peruvian sociologist Anibal Quijano developed the concept of coloniality to specifically name the role of racism and capitalism in the colonization of indigenous lands and societies. So not all colonialism is necessarily racist, but when he talks about the coloniality of power, he sees colonialism and racism, the categorization of some people as more human than others, as mutually constitutive, such that relations of power are organized by racism, capitalism, and oppression. So settler colonialism and racism then mutually reinforce the other. Fanon, Frida, and Quijano, however, were not engaging with how these systems affected women and gender diverse people. And so this idea of the coloniality of gender becomes really important for us. This is an idea that was introduced by Maria Lugones, an Argentinian feminist philosopher who builds upon Quijano's notion of the coloniality of power, but through the lens of gender. She writes, the naturalizing of sexual differences is another product of the modern use of science that Quijano points out in the case of race. The premise of biological determinism was a Western European epistemology that carried an assumption that all societies were inherently patriarchal and organized by sex differences. Western European epistemology assumed that all societies viewed human existence through biological determinism, and they used these ideas to control reproduction and labor. And then later in the 19th century, Western European medical sciences begin to encode racialized sex differences, as well as physical differences of people, which form, form the foundations of medical racism today. Forms of reproductive oppression that were used to serve capitalist ends during colonialism took the forms of rape and physical violence during pregnancy or lactation, forced wet nursing, separation of infants from their mothers and families and sending them to boarding schools, experimenting with new painful medical and surgical procedures on enslaved women without anesthesia or pain inter interventions and infanticide. Lugonis writes, it is important to ask how sexual dimorphism served and serves Euro-centered global capitalist domination and exploitation. Considering critically both biological dimorphism and the position that gender socially constructs biological sex is pivotal to understanding the scope 
depth, and characteristics of the colonial modern gender system. As she builds out this concept of the coloniality of gender, she draws upon the work of indigenous and black scholars and scholars from the global South around the world. She includes Paula Gunn Allen's work, The Sacred Hoop, Recovering the Feminine and American Indian Traditions, and notes that as Gunn Allen and others make clear, intersex individuals were recognized in many tribal societies prior to colonization without assimilation into a sexual binary. It's important to consider the changes that colonization brought to understand the scope of the organization of sex and gender under colonialism and in Euro-centered global capitalism. Gendered and sex categories were used to control reproduction among indigenous peoples and enslaved peoples. And Lagana cites Patricia Hill Collins. Through her reading of Hill Collins' work, she notes that colonial governance racialized a sex and gender binary which weaponized reproduction through racialized oppression and reinforced patriarchal systems of power and wealth extraction. Hill Collins' work shows how the stereotypes of, the black, of black women as a mammy or as a Je Jezebel have historic origins in slavery. Lugonas also cites o o Oye Wumi's work in articulating further that binary sex and gender categories are neither natural nor human universals. Oyewumi notes, as Euro-centered global capitalism was constituted through colonization, gender differentials were introduced where there were none. This way of organizing human physical and sociocultural difference emanating from Western European epistemology were used to rationalize violence against gender diverse peoples, people with diverse expressions of sexual pleasure and relationships that were not heteronormative. Oyewumi is a Nigerian Yoruba sociologist and gender scholar who wrote a groundbreaking book called The Invention of Women in 1997. And in this book, she writes, quote, the usual gloss of Yoruba categories, Obinrin and Okunrin, as female or woman and male or man, respectively, is a mistranslation. These categories are neither binarily opposed nor hierarchical. And gender has only become important in Yoruba studies not as an artifact of Yoruba life, but because Yoruba life past and present has been translated into English to fit the Western pattern of body reasoning. More recently, Oyewumi has published a new book titled What Gender is Motherhood? And here she expands on the problem of English translation. The assumption that translation begins with a colonizer's language and trickles down is emblematic of the power and authority imbalances in the coloniality of the global health industrial complex. In her book, she recounts a story of speaking to an audience of graduate students in the United States and being attentive to trying to learn everyone's names and their new gender inclusive pronouns. And she recalls, quote, I was amused at the idea of choosing one's own personal pronoun. What a pity, I thought. Learn to speak Yoruba. North Americans would not have to reinvent the wheel if they adopted Yoruba, one of the many African languages whose pronouns and personal names do not, quote unquote, do gender. Yoruba do not need a new language, new pronouns, or new names, because their language is not organized on the basis of gender categories. Hence, there are no gendered pronouns, no gendered names, or gendered kinship categories. Western colonizers who would civilize natives were actually imposing on Africans their crude languages with their gendered preoccupations, gender binaries, and gender discriminatory male dominant ideologies. Thus, the original non-genderedness of the Yoruba language becomes invisible as native speakers adjust their vocabulary to model the English language. In decolonizing methodologies, Maori scholar Linda Tuhiwai Smith also scrutinizes the coloniality of language around gender. She says, gender distinctions and hierarchies are so deeply encoded in Western languages, it's impossible to speak without using this language and more significantly for indigenous people. It is impossible to translate or interpret our societies into English, French, or Castilian, for example, without making gender distinctions. So the fact that we see gender and sex binaries and distinctions showing up around the world isn't because it is a natural or a universal. It has its history in colonialism and the coloniality of gender. Further theorizing the intersections of colonialism, race, and gender, Lagana cites Kimberly Crenshaw's theory of intersectionality, 
like Oyabumi Logonis rejects the idea that women and mothers or families are quote unquote the same everywhere. She notes that in Western feminist scholarship and Euro American feminist movements, it is only when we perceive gender and race as enmeshed or fused that we actually see women of color. Transnational feminist scholar Chandra Talpad Mohante expanded further on these ideas in her work, Feminism Without Borders, scrutinizing in particular biological essentialism as a way to assume some universality of women's experiences. She notes, quote, such simplistic formulations are both reductive and ineffectual in designing strategies to combat oppression. All they do is reinforce, reinforce binary divisions between men and women. What is problematical then is about this use of woman as a group, as a stable category of analysis that assumes an ascent historical universal unity between women based on a generalized notion of their subordination. This move limits the definition of the female subject to gender identity, completely bypassing social class and ethnic identities. What characterizes women as a group is their gender, not biologically defined over and above everything else, including a monolithic notion of sexual difference. Ugandan human rights scholar, Celia Tamale takes this a step further and writes against biological determinism and binary sex dichotomies. In her recent book, Decolonization and Afrofeminism, she notes, quote, the term gender has long been contested by women in the global South for its essentializing or homogenizing utility that imagines all women to suffer from oppression in the same way. And while the legal term equity, e equality within the paradigm of universal human rights invokes righteousness and fairness, in reality, it is a concept that rings hollow for many of the marginalized. Its very conception as sameness or equivalence has been challenged by many theorists, compelling us to recast the dominant discourses of patriarchy and oppression. And while the category women may be used for some context for challenging gender specific oppressions against this social group, its liberatory potential is quite limited. Would women, for example, include intersex persons, transgender women, or lesbian women? Ramon Grofogel reminds us that identity politics cannot lead to transformative change because of their links to the coloniality of power. Oyebumi has also said on this topic, in the West, the challenge of feminism is how to proceed from the gender saturated category of women to the fullness of an unsexed humanity. These words inspire me to think of inclusive language as one action towards liberation from gender and sex-based oppression and violence through action that is inspired by indigenous languages and epistemologies. Audre Lorde reminds us that for the master's tools, we'll never dismantle the master's house. They may allow us to temporarily beat him at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring, our, around general, bring about genuine change. We need new tools, decolonized methodologies, methodologies grounded in research justice and language that more accurately describes the diversity of human bodies, reproductive experiences, sexualities, and relationalities. We need to colonize methodologies that center indigenous ways of knowing to advance equity and justice in science and medicine and public health. Biological anthropologist Augustin Fuentes eloquently summarizes what indigenous peoples have known, that the man, woman, and masculine, feminine are neither biological terms nor rooted exclusively in biology. He says, quote, the lack of an explicit binary is especially evident in humans given the complex neurobiologies, life histories, and morphological dynamics of our species. There are many successful biologically diverse ways to be human, and millions of people embody this diversity. Growing up human means growing up in a world of varying gender expectations, body types, reproductive options, family structure, and sexual orientations. Binary sex and gender dichotomies are no longer supported by the biological sciences. In some rhetoric against the use of gender inclusive language, there is a misrepresentation of history in which US cultural imperialism is defined as affecting the rest of the world with notions of sex and gender diversity and demands to use gender inclusive terms. The playbook of this rhetoric has been analyzed extensively and is associated with various attacks on so-called queer theory and gender ideology, 
It hasn't been applied to our field until very recently. So I've shared one resource that I think will be sent to participants today, which is a chapter out of um, the Rights at Risk Report, Time for Action, which provides an historical background and an analysis of this rhetorical playbook that is used to oppress the rights of sex and gender minority groups around the world. Dialogue is critical for these issues, but it should be informed by an accurate representation of the history of sex, gender, sexuality, and kinship, which includes indigenous experiences, knowledges, and scholarship of people from across the global South. When I reflect on the moment that we are in currently, as we address the challenges of inclusive language in biomedicine and public health, I view it from the lens of the scholars that I have mentioned here. It's hard to get things to fit into English and other colonizer languages because of the sex and gender binary, homo and hetero binary, which are so deeply entrenched in our patriarchal racist view of the world. I see a movement of decolonizing medicine and public health, one that is centuries long. As long as indigenous peoples have been resisting colonization and the erasure of cultural knowledge about sex diversity and gender fluidity. We can do better today than continuing to use heteronormative ideas, words, and concepts about human bodies and reproduction, literally from the medieval times. I also think about decolonization through the words of Jared Hayes in their editorial on decolonizing sex and sexuality for the journal Middle East and Women's Studies. A decolonization that would be at the same time a deconstruction of ethnocentrism, of the male-female binary, of the hetero-homo binary, and creating new pathways for collective action against all forms of sex-based and gender-based violence, oppression, and erasure. But this work for many of us requires cultural humility. So I would like to offer some suggestions for us as a field as we begin to practice critical self-reflection. We can ask, what are my attitudes about gender diverse people becoming pregnant, breastfeeding, and parenting? What will I do when I don't understand others' experiences or have a difficult time accepting differences? How do my attitudes shape my ability to relate to others with compassion and respect? What questions do I have about what I don't understand? What actions can I take to learn more about topics, issues, or lived experiences that I don't understand? And what opportunities are there for me to stand together with people experiencing sex and gender-based oppression? I've offered a few resources with this presentation. I'd like to amplify that the Harvard SOGI group um, is, has this outstanding looking reprodu um, reproductive health seminar series. The first session was just last week, um, and I believe there is a session that is devoted specifically to, to language. So I encourage you to check it out. Um, I'm sure if you Google it, you, could, you can see the link to register. It's open to the public. Um, and it's got a phenomenal lineup of scholars who have really been in this, in this space and working on these issues specifically for sexual and reproductive health for some time. I've also pulled together some suggestions for resources. Um, if you're interested in learning more about um, LGBT rights and law, um, UNHCR also has a Born Equal and Free Sexual Orientation, Gender Identity, and Sex Characteristics in International Human Rights Law, which is very informative for those who are engaging in research um, and reading research, um, designing studies to be more inclusive. Um, the Sex and Gender Equity and Research Guidelines are very, very informative. Um, and then the WHO has a Gender Mainstreaming for Health Professionals um, document that is currently being updated, so keep an eye out for that. For our field in specific, um, for lactation, we have a, a number of wonderful resources. Um, if you haven't already taken a look at the Journal of Human Lactation's um, um, resources here on gender inclusive language, um, some explanations and definitions, and some recommendations for making your practices more gender affirming, I suggest starting here. Um, the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine also has a statement on language. And I highly encourage um, those of us in this community of USBC and within your own communities of practice um, to engage with those organizations that are serving queer, trans, non-binary, and gender diverse people of color, and to collaborate and listen to and have opportunities to learn with and stand by people with diverse lived experiences. So in conclusion, 
Current definitions of human dichotomous biological sexes, gender, sexualities, and kinship relations are tied up in deep histories of coloniality, racism, and sexual and reproductive oppression. Indigenous cultural understandings of human diversity can inform gender expansive and inclusive modes of communication about sexual and reproductive health. And critiques of inclusive language are connected discursively to broader political movements that threaten gender equity, health, and human rights globally. As Rue and all colleagues uh, note, gender inclusive language is an immediate action that we can all take to ensure that gender disperse, diverse people are not oppressed and marginalized in our work. But I'd like to offer that these issues aren't simply about words and language, that we really have to do the work to overcome our biases, become more informed about the issues, and engage in dialogue that is inclusive of indigenous scholars and scholars of color throughout the global South. Finally, I am inspired by Lagonis' call to action and it is with this spirit that I shared this presentation today. She writes, I mean to begin a conversation and a project of collab collaborative participatory research and popular education to begin to see its in its details the long sense of the processes of the colonial gender system enmeshed in the coloniality of power into the present, to uncover collaboration and to call each other to reject it in its various guises as we recommit to communal integrity in a liberatory direction. We need to understand the organization of the social so as to make it visible, so as to make visible our collaboration with system, systemic racialized gender violence so as to come to an inevitable recognition of it in our maps of reality. Thank you for your attention and for the opportunity to present to you today. Thank you so much, Dr. Palmquist. We are going to shift into Q&A. Um, so one of the first questions that came in was about um, an earlier part of your presentation. Can you expand on what the wandering uterus term was and how it was used to repress the female body? The wandering uterus was the, a diagnosis. It was a concept that tried to help explain why females had certain kinds of ailments. And so at that time, they obviously didn't have the, the tools that we have now. And so the, the idea was that at many different kinds of ailments that a, a female might be experiencing, the uterus was the explanation for it. And the more that the philosophy sort of centered on that, the more of the constellation of things um, were attributed to being female. So things like certain kinds of mental health issues, which was called hysteria, um, other, other kinds of of explanations such as um, the repression of sexual activity. Um, these things were all associated with having a uterus and sort of uh, anom anomalies and pathologies of the uterus. Um, it was used to uh, repress or sort of um, continue to perpetuate gender-based oppression in medicine because the explanation was just being female. It really created a barrier towards um, trying to explore other possible explanations that were sort of grounded in human biology. Um, and what it really, what we, when you kind of look at the history of the con of his hysteria and of the hysterectomy, um, we really see some biases around females being more prone to things like mental illnesses, mood swings, um, different kinds of um, sort of more psychological issues. So there was a, a, a stigmatization and a stereotyping of women as a lesser sex and a lesser gender that sort of emanates from these ideas. And those ideas, as I mentioned, persis persisted um, well into the 20th century, even though they're very, very ancient. Thank you so much for expanding on that. Um, are there any ba best practices or recommendations you could provide about introducing this top the topic of, of gender diverse language um, to an audience, especially um, so many of us are on a learning journey. Um, do you have any recommendations around that? There were a couple of questions that came in around sort of institutional resistance and maybe how to, um, some recommendations on how to approach that. 
I'm happy to give you some of my thoughts about that, but I feel like, um, as I mentioned in the presentation, we are so we're so um, early as <laughs> in our society and as our field to just begin to wrap our minds around the idea that not all people on the planet have organized their societies and institutions around a sex difference. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think like becoming sort of making part of our practice about thinking about how to institutionalize to communicate these things, um, just really practicing some of that um, self-directed learning, learning in community um, and being you know, more informed about the issues, the broader issues. There are, there is not, not um, there's not a shortage of best practices for gender affirming language and gender affirming, affirming care in clinical settings. Um, not all of it has been specific to lactation, but they are, they, they're transferable. And so there are tools that are available. Um, there is guidance on best um, practices. That, that paper that I mentioned, um, Charlie Rue and um, colleagues sort of outlined some best practices for communicating in epidemiology and public health, which can be, I think, transferred to different contexts. Mm -hmm. um, so my hope is that, you know, I, I understand that this is sort of a kickoff of um, some different sessions of learning for those in the USBC community. And I'm hopeful that maybe what will come out of that are some resource libraries and some conversation and dialogue about, you know, how, how are, what are the challenges our different organizations or folks facing in their institutions about introducing the idea and talking about the idea, what are some things that have been helpful. Um, I think there's probably not a one size fit all um, solution, which can be really frustrating. I think some of us like we want to go from, um, you know, here to being more inclusive. And I want to caution that just integrating certain kinds of words and languages is not necessarily going to lead you to the place where we have like true inclusive care. Mm -hmm. um, and so there has to, I think there needs to be some other things to buttress that along the way and some learning and capacity building. So um, I think like there, are, there are folks who run organizations that do consultancies and can help coach institutions to provide those. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, even though these conversations are maybe new for us in the field and some of these, you know, terms that we're, that are circulating are sort of new for us, um, the idea of gender affirming care and providing, you know, creating um, care environments and institutional policies, that's not new, that those tools are available for us to think about. Um, so I, I think it would be, um, yeah, I would just, we, we're not necessarily in a place where we have to reinvent the wheel. What I think, what I, you know, what I hope with this presentation is just to give a, a maybe a different perspective and a bird's eye view to help us deconstruct some of the assumptions we make, we're making about mm -hmm. where these ideas come from um, and whether or not we really need to care. Thank you so much. Um, can you talk more about how gendered language impacts health outcomes? You participate in a lot of research. Um, what have you seen in your research about the impact of gendered language on health outcomes um, for those that don't identify with conventional gender? I mean, this is not actually, I'm not an expert in this area of research, but I, what I have learned over the course of trying to um, do research to present this presentation is that in general, stigmatization against people who don't conform to sex or gender norms, um, just being stigmatized and being um, concerned about being stigmatized in some way or criminalized or um, spoken to har with harm, you know, being abused in the clinical, like all those are barriers to accessing care. Um, and then by the, the, on the flip side, if, if providers um, aren't sort of integrating the recommended best practices and aren't um, making space to have more inclusive care, they may not be asking the right questions. They may not have the tools to communicate with patients in a way that is um, more compassionate and more sensitive to their individual needs. So I think um, you know, those kinds of barriers just around miscommunication and then also around stigmatization are really, really important. Um, I think there's also, you know, we, I'm not a, I'm not a physician, I'm not a, um, a clinician. I, I think that there are, there are probably um, situations where assumptions are made about a person's 
biology based on their gender presentation, which may lead to um, poor communication and misdiagnoses of things of that nature. So we know that um, this is, you know, especially trans and non-binary and other um, in intersex folks who are um, pregnant and postpartum um, receive really poor care because a lot of these practices haven't been integrated. So I think, um, again, just reiterating that there are resources out there for, for people mm -hmm. if you are a clinician and really tra trying to think about improving your clinical skills, um, there, are, there are tools and, and resources um, available. Thank you so much. And I just want to address um, a question that I've seen pop up a few times about access to slides and resources. Dr. Palmquist has actually developed a, a beautiful bibliography of resources that we will be sharing um, in the follow-up um, email. So you will get access to um, a, a nice list of res resources um, to engage with post-webinar. Um, so this I, web, oh, go ahead. No, no, mm -hmm. I want to say I, um, I included two open access um, publications. So one is Lugonis's essay on the coloniality of gender, um, mm -hmm. which I, you know, I sort of mapped the presentation to. So I think, you know, for a reading um, that if you're interested in that work um, and sort of building your bibliography there is a good place to start. And then the right, um, the report on the AWID report on um, the rights at risk, um, chapter three, to really sort of look at um, sort of the, the, architecture of some of these rhetorical arguments against gender inclusive language. Thank you. So this webinar is happening right after National Coming Out Day, which was yesterday, October 11th. And um, it's very interesting to think about that in context of what you shared earlier in your presentation about how many societies have a very expansive view of gender. Um, and so what do you think of this session being lifted or presented um, with the proximity to National Coming Out Day? I think it's, um, I mean, I, I think it was really good timing. I think the idea that these, the idea that, um, that there are expansive ways to experience, um, you know, who, who we are as people, that regardless of like what body or biology that we have um, is important. And we think it's things, these are ideas that people have been talking about for some time, but um, increasingly we also, we're, and this has to do with sort of that, that report about rights at risk. We're seeing sort of this idea that we see sex and gender binaries and dichotomies and gender dichotomies everywhere in the world. Like these, these ideas, um, are the ideas we use to communicate and they're easy, you know, easy to translate. And so that's why we should just kind of stay with this, the standard language we've always used. Um, and and um, I think the challenge there is just to understand like why the reason that there are so many commonalities isn't because societies have always been organized in those ways. Like the reasons why have to do with coloniality. Um, and so I think, I think it also is really important for for us to have, you know, just as a social and public awareness of the of diversity and that different cultures and different societies, particularly indigenous um, epistemologies, offer us some very powerful tools for thinking through, like how how do we actually like think about um, sex, human biology, and sex and gender and kinship um, in a more expansive way. And so we don't have to, that's like that some of other scholars, like I mentioned, we don't have to recreate things. Like we just need to listen to um, people who come from these um, indigenous communities um, that have those tools and those ways of thinking that can really help us. So I, I don't know, I hope that, um, I mean, the, the anthropologist in me just hopes that it can be like one step of broadening our perspective a little bit. Um, because I, I'm, I'm aware that these aren't lessons that necessarily, I mean, I don't even know if um, physicians and, and, and nurses and others even have a lot of um, schooling in the history of medicine <laughs> as part of their training too. So all of those things I think are really important for us to think about as we mm -hmm. um, are dealing with some of these more challenging topics. Yeah. 
Thank you so much. There are lots of comments that have come through just thanking you for um, so much uh, wisdom and, and knowledge. Um, lots and lots and lots of comments thanking you and very grateful for the resources that you've prepared um, and excitement to engage in those as well. Um, we are going to shift into some USBC updates um, really quickly. All right. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, the USBC believes that courageous and invigorating conversations are essential to achieving our vision of thriving families and communities. And as such, we will be hosting a peer learning opportunity for our membership network to discuss goals, successes, and challenges in navigating gender-inclusive language within their organizations. Uh, registration for this peer learning opportunity will be open on Monday, October 31st. If you are a staff, board or volunteer of a member organization and would like to stay up to date on opportunities like this, uh, please share your information um, using the link that's going to be shared in the chat um, for our member affiliate form. And we'll add you to our mailing list so that you can stay connected um, for opportunities such as these. And if your organization is not currently a member of the USBC, you can change that at any point, simply fill out our membership interest form that's been shared um, also in the chat and the membership team will follow up with you. We also would like you to save the date for our next webinar, Pursuing Policy Solutions, Lessons Learned from USBC, which will be presented by two of USBC's very own, Cheryl Lebedevich, USBC's Senior Policy and Communications Manager, and Amelia pismike Seeger, USBC's Deputy Director. At the end of the session, attendees will be able to identify key components of collective impact, utilize tools for collaborative change, and describe key steps in the legislative process. Registration for this webinar is projected to open in a couple of weeks, so stay tuned. And finally, we want to say a heartfelt thank you to our donors. Uh, donations are absolutely critical to our work and the sole source of support for our advocacy efforts in our course to achieving our mission. If you'd like to donate to the USBC, please use the link in the chat and we thank you in advance for your generosity. And finally, we welcome you all to complete the satisfaction survey for today's presentation. You can find the link to the survey in the chat box. If you would like to receive continuing education for this webinar, please be sure to complete that satisfaction survey and make your request within the form as soon as possible. Um, certificates will be sent out no later than October 31st. And that brings us to the end of today's session. Thank you for participating in today's webinar and thank you for all that you do to support families. Thank you again to Dr. Palmquist for sharing, again, your wealth of knowledge with us. Please be on the lookout for the follow-up email, which will contain resources prepared by Dr. Palmquist um, and the recording. We hope you have a wonderful day.